Those who were at the last talk, um, worst song in the history of music, <laughs> hold my beer. We, we also have sound houses where we practice and demonstrate all sounds and their generation. We have harmonies which you have not. Now, those words published by Francis Bacon in 1627 either foresaw generative music or perhaps even willed it into being because Daphne Oram pinned those up to her wall at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. And when she left there, the studio she founded was indeed called The Sound House. And she, the, her, her dreams of uh, graphic scores creating, creating sounds were realized. So, but, but this is not the story of Daphne Oram's Oramics Machine and the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, though I do know it. <laughs> Somebody might get the reference. Um, but really, it was a passage in Douglas Adams's first Dirk Gently book that maybe got me onto the idea that mathematics could generate images and those images themselves could generate sounds. That's not the quote, I shan't spoiler it, but the, uh, the protagonist finds himself in a room where every point in space there is a, a, new, a new music. And later still, I found myself at Finsbury Park's Hinoima, the Malediction Club, where I learned that noise could indeed count as, count as music, and that is documented very well by uh, Jennifer Wallace in her, her tome, Fight Your Own War. But for all this grand talk of um, Daphne Oram, or perhaps Merz Bowen and influences, I, I must warn you, the, the songs, the sounds I heard on those fateful nights, they didn't really sound anything like these sounds. This is just a tribute. Sorry. In advance. Yeah, it's a swindle. I've got, I've got form for this. Two years ago, I was here doing Lorenz Attractor Sounds in Oblique Strategies Against Humanity. Um, don't worry about the links. If you, my slide share is on every page and you can have these slides in almost, but not entirely the wrong fonts. Last year I was at, so Oblique Strategies Against Humanity was mostly Lorentz Attractor sounds. There were some Lorentz Attractor sounds at Shah last year with indiscreet music, but it was mostly cellular automata. Um, People kept saying they liked the Lorentz Attractor sounds, which was hardly fair, so there won't be any Lorentz Attractor sounds today. Anyway, this is where the story really starts. I bought a scarf. I bought a generative, one-dimensional Wolfram Cellular Automata scarf. Well, I didn't buy it, I funded it. I've heard it has actually shipped. I shall have it in time for the, for the autumn. Um, so that was, that was produced by one Fabian Serrier, who, or, who's, whose name I probably just mangled. Um, so, in order to check the progress of my scarf, I, I looked at a, a, one of her, a, a video of hers on Strange Loop, the, the Papers We Love section, and I was introduced to um, generative seashell patterns and a book called The Algorithmic Beauty of Seashells. So go and look, go, go and watch the Strange Loop video. It's probably it's much more. Well, there's no, there's no noise at least. Well, there's this very good knitting machine noise. It's probably better than my noises. I try to get my, my revenge on, on, on Fabienne. Um, although the, the generative mollusk patterns you're going to see work on, a, on the sort of basis of diffusion of, of pigments and inhibitors and, and hormones and such like, there is in fact a certain lizard where the, the automata works on the basis of one cell, one pixel. So there's a, there's a paper in nature and 
a research group did tracking of these lizards as they walked around their their tank. So they they tracked the pro each lizard and mapped its uh, mapped its scale patterns and deduced from that the 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 underlying automata. So it, it literally is one scale, one pixel. And I, I I was mailing her last night. In fact, I said, well, oh great, my scarf my scarf's coming. I'm I'm doing a, a thing at EMF. Have you heard about these lizards? She said, no. Um, could, could I could I have a knitted generative lizard? Well, if you send me the code, oh dear, did I just volunteer for the soft toy industry? I think I have. Um, if you want to go and find the algorithmic beauty of seashells, um, I'd recommend finding it second hand because at least the vendor there will tell you if it comes with the CD with the, with the software on it. Um, but yeah, thanks again, Springer. Um, it does appear to be available new on the Springer website. Unfortunately, when you click through to the place where it says download the, uh, the supplementary materials, there's no mention of any software. So I've no idea if those new additions come, come with the software. And this was, in fact, part of a, a series. There's the algorithmic beauty of seaweed, sponges, and corals. These seem, also seem to come in multiple ebook editions, one more expensive than the other. One probably a sort of cheaper, grottier rendering of the PDF, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but the algorithmic beauty of plants, there's a legitimate PDF you can find out of that, and they've got all their code. Yeah, it's a reasonably complete piece of software that, that comes with the book. Um, there are various options for for visualization, the, the, you know, the colors, the, the, the geometry of the display. And there are reasonably complex options for setting up the initial conditions of the simulations and even how they, how they change over time. And it's quite a piece of work, but basic. Um, Fabian took quite heroic efforts to avoid re-implementing or, or running the, the original code with, with virtualization. That's, that in itself is, is quite a, a story to behold. But let's look at this. Um, we're iterating over multiple substances, JA to JS. We're going to go sub to old decay and do something stateful and hateful. So very, very slowly, this has been turning into something approaching a proper Python module, and you can just iterate over the, the mollusk pattern, which is, in fact, sort of turning legacy code in, into, into more modern Python is, is my day job, so I, so I ought to be capable. The, the call hormone function, or rather the, the, the line afterwards, is interesting. We're, there's a mysterious C for, for hormone concentration that's only defined within a, an if statement that may or may not fire. And you think, oh, what's that going to be? But then you look, look to the top and you see that, oh, just like Fortran, um, the variable will be initialized as, as, as floating point on, on, a, on, the, on the basis of which letter of the, alpha, uh, the alphabet it starts with. But hang on, we're dividing by it. There's a divide by zero by default, lovely. But these things do work. So there's, there's my Python Oliver Porphyria mollusk next to a, a photograph of the real thing. I don't know if you're, you, you believe in, in synchronicities, but the Olivia Porf, sorry, Oliver Porphyria looks rather like the viciously venomous uh, cone snail, one of the most venomous creatures in the world, apparently. And I know this because I went to the Natural History Museum uh, Venom exhibition, and it, it turned out that two friends who I, I knew worked at the, the Natural History Museum, in fact, devote their time to, to snails. And then there was someone at the London Pi Data event talking about the, the generative geometry of the, the shells and the, the shapes of the cells themselves, and somebody somebody got a tattoo of a snail on, on their neck, so it seems to be, I seem to be somehow destined to produce generative mollusk sounds. And the way, that, the way these thing, this thing works is you have num a number of uh, substances that diffuse, that's the bit I managed to, to vectorize in, in NumPy, and they interact with each other, and Oliver Porphyria, I believe they have, 
you, you, you have what I, I believe is called an uh, activator inhibitor reaction. So there's various couplings between the substances as they diffuse, and one of them one of them is the pigment. But before we make mollusk sounds, a little diversion. Yeah, the, the, the thing on the left is a, is a Gauss map. Can this microphone go higher so I can actually look at the audience? Oh, I've, I've managed it, thank you. That's better, I can, I can see my slides and you at the same time. So, we're going to have a recurrence relation. We're going to pick a fairly arbitrary initial value of x, feed it into the simple expression on the right, which has two parameters, alpha and beta, and the next x is going to be generated from the previous one. And we're going to generate a sequence of x values, maybe chuck away the first few as transients, and we're going to slowly build up a histogram. So there are regions where the system visits quite frequently, and there are places where it doesn't go at all. And we're going to take that histogram and treat it as a slice of an image, and the height of the histogram is going to be the intensity of the image. And we're going to vary the beta parameter and scan across a whole set of these slices and build up a single, a single image. And then we're going to change the alpha parameter slightly, scan beta back down again, make a new image, and that's going to produce, well, a video, an animation. So beta's varying on the horizontal axis, scanning up and down, and alpha is varying through time. And we're going to abuse Fourier transforms and treat those those, those histograms on the bifurcation diagram as spectra. So if you imagine the uh, bar graph visualization you might have on, on, on your, your audio player or your, your, your spectrum analyzer, we're going to run that in reverse with NumPy's real FFT library. Now, the, the point of a Fourier transform is we're going to assume that a signal is periodic and we're going to build a spectrum for it. Well, we've already established that we're having varying spectra. So for the, the short time inverse Fourier transform, we treat a bit, cheat a bit rather, and we're going to take each histogram, inverse Fourier transform it, multiply it by a, a vaguely Gaussian bell-shaped looking uh, window function, though that's, it's not Gaussian. I believe I used the Blackman-Harris. We're going to create a series of those um, audio signals, superimpose them, and play on. So the right channel is going to be the left channel played backwards, and I'll see if I can get the, the video going and assault you with it. See if this full screens correctly. No, not yet.
Oh, thank you. We now wait for the... Oh, I wonder if F5 will work. Can you help me get my mouse back? I can see, I, can, I just can't get it back to my laptop. Oh, nearly there. It was too quick. Oh, thank you. That's better. Right, I'm going to unplug the laptop and... do audio from my music player from now on. So if there's a pop, that's not part of the show. Yeah, that was a little bit of a cheat. If you know anything about Fourier transforms, you undoubtedly know that you need complex spectra, and we all we had was a single array of of array of real values. I'm not going to explain about DC and Nyquist and how you um, pack a, uh, a, f a complex frequency spectrum so that its inverse Fourier transform gives you a real, a real, uh, a real signal. No, not not today. In the, the, the this ungodly hour of the morning. Hang on. Come on. Yeah, suffice it to say, as I mentioned, we have multiple substances in the um, Oliva Porphyra simulation. Well, we can take the real amplitudes from the activator part, which is what generally gets sort of plotted with a, with a threshold to produce the image. The inhibitor concentration on the, on the mollusk will use that to be the, uh, the uh, imaginary amplitude. And we're going to take, do exactly the same thing. We're going to take the, uh, these, treat these things as histograms. And the center of the histogram, you know, the, 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 the point on the spectrum where there's as much amplitude as, you know, to the left, to the right, call it the, the sort of the center of mass, that's going to pan the signal from, from left to right. And when that crosses the x-axis, when it's balanced, it will trigger yet another mollusk, and that one has GASP, four active substances. So the left channel will be the activator and an inhibitor, and the right channel will be two other substances whose names or functions I can't quite remember. I think one of them is to do with ex called extinction. Um, for some reason, I have uh, decided to call this next one Wheelkeeper Welk Come in the Hillside. Oop, no, sorry. Damn thing.
Yes, I'm a, that was originally three minutes, but uh, a friend of mine gave it the official, um, official Lovecraftian ethnomusicology seal of approval, so you, you've him to blame for it stretching out to four. No, no Lorenz attractor noises, but I, I can talk about them. The, the circuit on the right is uh, of Hor done by Paul Horowitz of uh, Horowitz and Hill Art of Electronics uh, fame. And I did build one, and the, it's the rat's nest to the, to the bottom left, and a very nice person at the London hack space let me attach it to his galvos and his laser, and it produced the rather nice laser Lorentz attractor at the top. Unfortunately, the sort of uh, speed that gives you decent uh, persistence of vision doesn't necessarily uh, give you particularly interesting sounds, even if you, uh, you attach those signals as control voltages of, of analog synths. And there are other problems. There's a big, nasty rotary switch for switching the capacitors to change the speed. And if you think, well, what if I wanted, what if I wanted two Lorentz attractors, one slightly shifted to pick up the, the sensitive dependence on, on the initial conditions? And oh, what if I wanted to vary the parameters? So that would be either digital pots or messing around with transconductance amplifiers or whatever to have control voltages changing the the parameters of the attractor. It, I haven't abandoned it, but it all got a little bit gritty. So here's a list of things I have tried or haven't yet tried. First thing I did, in fact, was um, SVG and web audio in the, in the browser, which people quite liked, apparently. I have tried controlling Super Collider via, via Overtone, which is written in Clojure. I might, I might come back to that, in fact, and redo the the SVG in browser stuff in ClojureScript. Just for, that's for my idea of fun anyway. You can start implementing things in C++ as LV2 plugins, which probably no one has heard of, or the sort of, the, the methadone to uh, Eurorack and modular synths is a thing called VCV rack. I hardly recommend you go to the VCV rack uh, workshop because I won't be there because I'll be going, you know, safe in the knowledge that I won't be there because I'll be going, well, can we have Lorenz attractors? No, but I'd better go off and write one and see then. So eventually I gave in and just resorted to taking the, uh, the variables coming out of a Lorenz attractor, the signals, quantizing them to 128 MIDI notes and shoving them down some analog synths. I called that Merry Christmas, Mr. Lorenz. Well, well, of course I did. It's the sort of thing I do. And annoyingly, people quite liked it, even though it was my, uh, it was a rather, a, I thought, a rather dodgy compromise, all that uh, quantization. Or you can cheat. If you run your Lorenz attractor generator on a Raspberry Pi, you can take the signal out as uh, via the uh, GPIO pins and use it to run some cheap and fairly cheerful digital to analog converters. Now there are proper DACs available for the Pi, but they're audio DACs, and I want much more slowly varying signals that are, than audio, which would probably be high pass filtered out. And we're gonna take the output of those and then use them to drive some proper analog synths. So, not a Lorentz attractor as threatened, or, or as promised, but Duffing's oscillator instead. So that's a Duffing oscillator. It represents a, a damped oscillator. So alpha is the springiness of the springy bit of metal. Um, beta represents the, the non-linearity of that springy bit of metal. And it's been shaken and omega in that equation is the frequency with which the, uh, well, the, the driving frequency with which the, which with, with which the system is being shaken. So I tried it. 
I went and went out and acquired some DACs. I wanted nice temporal resolution, good, good dynamic range, so lots of bits. Preferably I2C instead of the Pi's SPI uh, bus through hole. Yeah, steady as a rock, but I sold her with this hand. And I wanted it cheap. Uh, this is what you want, this is what you get, this is what you want, this is what you get. I ended up for, for being cheap with uh, 10-bit two-channel SPI DAX, never mind. And it came out all, all quantized and spotty anyway. But having, having considered ripple currents and RC passive filters for literally seconds, I went to the first blog post on the subject I could find and then ignored it and just grabbed the first complete set of resistors and capacitors I could find, filtered the, filtered the output of the DAC and I got a nice fairly smooth looking duffing oscillator which you see below. So that's now sufficiently analog I think, yeah that's proper analog now. So that did get shoved into, into analog since we've got two DACs two channels, so we can have two duffing attractors slightly shifted. Um, frequency and the modulation of that frequency will come, will, will come from one attractor, and the other attractor will modulate amplitude and filter cutoff. And as is my obsession, when things cross axes, X or Y, it will trigger either, either the high or low tom, or open and closed hats on my uh, cheap and cheerful Korg Volker Beats drum machine. So I'll play you out with duffing oscillator noises instead of Lorentz ones. Eventually.
well. If, if New Order can get away with pressing, pressing play and walking off, I can't see why I shouldn't either. Um, at Shah, I was technically the, the, the last act on the, last, on the largest stage, so I, I kind of sort of headlined a festival by mistake. So uh, thank you for your attention. If there's time for questions, I'll take questions, or, I'll, or I can generally be found in, in Millie Ways. It's smoked brisket tonight by a challenge coin. Uh, so if we do have any questions, then uh, I can come round uh, and bring a mic. Um, there was one thing I would like to ask. Um, in terms of what we've sort of, the samples that you've, oh, sorry, that we've, you've um, provided today, um, are these uh, quite heavily curated or do you just kind of allow the uh, device to produce what it produces and then uh, sort of present that? Plausible deniability. There was, there was a, a quote, I, there was something I said at Shah that people picked up on. You've got to give the algorithm a fair chance at sounding terrible. Um, it wasn't me. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not responsible. The only, in fact, those sounds were mostly pretty dry. The, the only thing I did with my cheap and cheerful Korg chaos pedal um, was that given the, you know, the duffing oscillator is based on a spring, I think spring reverb is kind of fitting. Um, yeah, ev everything sounds better if you slap tape echo or reverb all over it, so it's... Uh, but in fact, that was, that was the only one that I, that I cheated on. I normally, I normally slap some sort of reverb over the, um, over the bifurcation diagram, but I, it sounds, but this time I, I couldn't be bothered. So that, that was dry as well. Um, the, in fact, it was only, only the last only the last sounds came out of any sort of analog physical music making device. Everything else was just hot out of the out of the Python console. Okay, well, um, thank you very much again to Charles Greenway for that talk on uh, generative music and mollusks.